Eastern Washington for about ten, uh, five years now. Um, I've been a part of Celebrate Recovery for almost 10 years, um, and I've helped a couple of different churches get a Celebrate Recovery started for their community. It's um, an amazing thing to be a part of, um, and in different areas, um, pretty much just answer the phone when anybody calls and asks questions. Um, so um, I just kind of cover the Eastern Washington area. Um, I helped groups in Oregon and Idaho and things like that too. Um, so it's, it's definitely an amazing process to be a part of and a minister, an amazing ministry to, to watch people um, walk in the room. I used to say, Watching them wake up and and um, realize their worth is um, it's pretty amazing. It's also something to be a part of personally as well. But I'll talk about that part later. So I'm going to share my testimony here. Uh, so um, when we share our testimony, especially for celebrate recovery, um, we write it down and we share it from a written form so that way we don't end up rambling because believe me, I'm capable of that. So, okay, I'm just gonna start. Um, my name's Jennifer, I'm a grateful believer who struggles with um, the effects of childhood trauma, shame, and eating disorder. Um, I was born in Monterey, California and grew up the oldest of three kids. My parents were, were a result of their own childhood trauma and carried their own emotional baggage into their marriage and parenting roles. My dad was a Vietnam vet who struggled with PTSD, anger, and was emotionally distant. My parents divorced when I was four years old and we moved to Tacoma, Washington. We didn't see our dad very often and my mother worked tonight as a single mom. Many times I was the caregiver for my younger siblings, my younger sibling, at five years old. We struggled quite a bit financially and many times did not have enough food, clean clothing, personal hygiene, or medical care. My mother had many different boyfriends in and out of our house. We moved several times. I attended at least 10 different elementary schools and three different high schools. Throughout my childhood, I was physically abused and ne um, neglected by my parents and sexually abused by my mother's, my mother's boyfriends and by my grandfather. During the summer of my second grade year, my brother and I went to visit my dad and new stepmom in Eastern Washington for the summer. When it was time to return home, my mother had disappeared. My dad received custody of us and I was enrolled into school. My entire world had been shaken and I shut down. My, my teacher reported I sat in class, did not interact or participate. I was reeling from feeling lost, angry, abandoned, rejected from my mom, whom I missed horribly. I began acting out in elementary school by stealing items from my classmates and vandalizing in school bathrooms. Then the joy bus came to, to my house. The joy bus was a school, a school bus painted bright blue, and it would pick up children in our neighborhood for Sunday school. My parents did not attend church, but I loved going. I met a woman at the church who saw me, the seven-year-old little girl, struggling to keep her four-year-old rambunctious brother quiet at church. She took us under her wing and became our grandma. While I didn't grow up with parents who prayed for me, I had a grandma who did. She was there the day I was baptized at 12 when I was married and had my first child. God provided a beautiful example. My life first I received when I was seven, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a hope, and a future and hope. My grandpa visited us from California when I was about 11. 
I absolutely loved my grandpa. He was a person in my life who I felt loved me and I felt safe with him. He would take take me around town and show me all off to all of his friends, buy me gifts and brag about me. I was so proud when my grandpa got to sleep in my room. But it was during this visit that my grandpa sexually abused me. I believed at that time I had done something to cause my grandpa's actions and that the sexual abuse was somehow my fault. I kept the abuse hidden for several years. I was repeatedly sexually victimized as I grew into my teens. As a result, my anger and shame grew and my self-worth became connected to what men expected of me and what I could do sexually. These pent-up feelings resulted in acting out behavior as I developed into a young teen. I felt like I was a bad kid who always made bad choices. In junior high, I could not walk past a group of boys in the hallway by myself and not feel fear or anxiety. I had learned I was not valuable enough to be heard when I said no. I had absolutely no rights to my own body, nor was I worth the safety and protection that I deeply desired. I felt I must have done something to cause these things to happen. My younger brother and I moved back to Tacoma to live with my real mom before the beginning of my eighth grade year. As a teen, I continued to take on the role of being responsible, the responsible caretaker for my brother. I had lots of friends back in Western Washington, but moving to Tacoma, I didn't know anybody. I quickly became isolated, depressed, and constantly worried about my brother and my mom's lifestyle choices. The food I ate had always been monitored and controlled before, and with all the fast food and unhealthy junk food we were eating, I quickly began to gain weight. My stepmom had struggled with her own weight gain, and when she saw I was gaining weight, she entered me into a weight loss program. She made comments on my appearance, on my weight gain, my, weight gain, my hair, my clothes. I became ashamed of my appearance, but was also able to lose weight. I started receiving and enjoyed the attention I was getting from the boys at school. I suddenly went from being invisible to being wanted, which gave me an amazing sense of control over my feelings of being a victim. My best friend showed me through binging and purging, over-exercising, and taking over-the-counter diet pills, then eventually not eating at all for lengthy periods of time, how I could quickly maintain weight loss. I found the ability to control my self-worth in the number on the scale and the size of the jeans I could fit into, as well as the attention I would get from the boys at school. I moved in with a boyfriend shortly after I graduated high school. He was rebellious and my family did not approve, which made it even more attractive to me. He used drugs and got drunk often, but promised he would stop for me. We got married and had two boys. He struggled with his drug and alcohol addiction, and I would nag and try desperately to control his behavior. Life was chaotic, and we argued frequently. It was pretty easy to blame him for all of the problems that we were having. I believed if he would just stop drinking, then we would be fine. I started attending Al-Anon, but was still only looking for whatever the secret was to get my husband to stop drinking. After three years, I asked for a divorce and moved back to Eastern Washington with our two sons to start my life as a single mom. In our new life, I was faced with emptiness, loneliness, and all the unresolved trauma rose to the surface. And of course, the best remedy was finding another man to fill that emptiness. I had several men involved in our lives and was sexually promiscuous. I placed my children and myself in unsafe situations and relationships. As a result, we all endured physical and emotional abuse and pain that we just shouldn't have. In between the births of my youngest son and my daughter, I had three abortions. I held so much anger, resentment, and bitterness for several years against myself and the men who I felt placed me in situations where I believed I had no choice. This year, this led to years of depression, blaming, bitterness, grief, and so much overwhelming shame. I struggled with PTSD and at times with suicidal ideation. I never allowed myself to grieve. 
through those babies because it was my choice that made it happen. I just continued to pile up the bitterness, guilt, and shame. I pushed the feelings down and focused on pulling myself up by my own bootstraps and getting my act together. Through all of this chaos, I was able to attend college as a non-traditional student and graduate with my degree in social work and family studies. The kids and I celebrated this success as I was able to finally move my children out of low-income housing and off of public assistance. I could finally provide my family without relying on if I received child support or not. We had health and dental insurance. We were finally headed in the right direction. But I never really shared with anyone the pain that I was feeling or what was going on in my life. I had grown up taking myself to church and I felt God's hand throughout my life, always pulling me back to a relationship with him. I just never believed I deserved to be there. I believed God did not love me. He certainly did not protect me. I was positive he did not forgive me. I couldn't even forgive myself. The kids and I began attending church in the small country town of Thorpe, population of about 280 people, and is located smack dab in the middle of Washington State. The church there is very small, with only about 25 or so members. Going to church on Sundays was refreshing and felt like a family reunion every week. It was the first place I learned how to understand the Bible and what having an actual relationship with God looked and felt like. The pastor and his wife, Roger and Janie, took my children and I under their wing. They accepted us as their family, checked in on us, and loved us unconditionally, even after I told them everything I had ever done. Roger and Janie took on the role of helping to be a true example of God's love and grace to me. I rededicated myself to the Lord and tried hard to do whatever felt right. I became the youth director for the youth group at the church. I attended Bible studies, asked a million questions, learned to pray, held to the belief that all the service I was involved in was helping me to find favor with God and, and made up for everything I had ever done to hurt him and others. I felt good and healthy, but I also still felt lonely, angry, bitter, and that something big was missing. Every time the church had an altar call, I went, just in case I really wasn't saved or the last time just wasn't enough. I just couldn't accept the fact that I was loved and accepted in God's eyes or in anyone else's, certainly not my own. My dad was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, in 2005. My job transferred me to Richland in 2007 to be near my dad during his final year of life. He passed away in May of 2008. During that time, my sons were struggling with their own drug and alcohol addictions. I was estranged from both my moms and younger siblings while grieving the death of my dad. I was living in a new area where I had no friends or real personal connections, no accountability. My life was in chaos, and all I knew was that it needed to be centered on God, whatever that was supposed to look like. I began attending a church in Richland, which just so happened to have a celebrate recovery program. My God, my son asked for help with his drug addiction, and we began attending CR together. I knew my life was chaotic, but if my son would just stop being addicted to drugs, we would be fine, right? <laughs> it took several months for me to realize, after hearing those people's testimonies, that I could relate to some of the issues people were struggling with and sharing and that I was one of those people, even if my struggle didn't include drugs and alcohol. I enjoyed coming to CR because everyone seemed free and happy. I just didn't know how they got there, but I knew I wanted what they had. After attending CR for a few months, a male leader began texting me and flirting with me. I came into CR, an invisible, numb, and broken person who was not even aware of her own brokenness. But I also felt pretty invincible, being in a town where no one really knew me. This attention was exciting and risky, but more importantly, it kept me stuck, doing what I had always done, staying in the same patterns, while distracting me from focusing on the pain I was feeling and working on my recovery. I effectively kept that part of my life hidden from everyone. I was as sick as my secrets. I was placed in a leadership position at CR, continuing to live a dualistic life, 
and only working on surface issues in my recovery. But God, he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. He certainly wasn't going to allow me to continue to serve in ministry without holding, without allowing him to change my heart. It became difficult to keep my secret life hidden. I was sick of the secrets, stuck in my shame, and just wanted out. I came clean to the church and CR about my situation. It was then I learned there were several other women whose lives were impacted by this same man. I was asked to step down from leadership and complete a restoration plan. <coughs> step three, we made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. I wasn't one of those who prayed to God and was instantaneously healed from my lifestyle, addictions, and compulsions. I'm still making the choice to work on my recovery every day. I had to allow myself to feel the feelings I had never allowed myself to feel before without covering them up with relationships, sex, or other people's approval of me. I had to answer the question my sponsor repeatedly asked me, how bad do you want to get well? Principle six, evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me. Make amends for harm I've done to others. Accept when to do so, would harm them or others. I'm not gonna lie, this was one of the most difficult seasons of my life, allowing myself to feel the pain of my life that I had successfully buried so deeply before. Learning to trust God every step of the way with my life is, still, is a skill I'm still learning. Recovery is work, and it was exhausting at first, but don't be fooled. I couldn't complete this with my own, in my own strength. Who knows where I would be without God's amazing grace. I am grateful to a God who directs my steps, doesn't ever give up on me, and shows me what being truly loved looks and feels like. I attended the CR Summit in California for the second time that August and was baptized by Mac and Mary Owen, national CR coaches. Mac whispered to me beforehand, you know, once we bring you up out of that water, you will be as pure as snow. Those words felt like cool hailing water on my soul, pure as snow. Today, I'm celebrating six years of being out of unhealthy, abusive relationships and sexually abstinent. I know without a doubt that no one will ever love me more than God. My self-worth is no longer attached to my relationship status or the opinion of others. I am daily giving up shame and trauma that I've carried throughout my entire life. I was a women's CR ministry leader for six years. God taught me so much while being a part of a successful, thriving CR ministry for a number of those years.